Um, so hello, everyone. I am Margaret Martinosi from Princeton. And uh, I've been collaborating with some of the EPIC folks for several years now on um, the tool flows and the quantum computing research that led us to where we are now, which is sort of launching uh, an effort focused on trying to build towards a practical uh, environment for quantum computing. Um, and in particular, as Fred mentioned, the next 10 years or so are viewed as, as this NISQ era of 10 to 1,000 qubits. Um, one thing that you can think about is the layering schemes that we have become familiar with in classical computing actually are open to discussion now for quantum computing. And in particular, the analogy I like to make is that we're in roughly where we were for 1950 on the classical computing side, where we had technologies like vacuum tubes or relay circuits down low and algorithms way up high and not much in the middle. Uh, transistor had been invented, uh, but we actually weren't using it in computers yet. And so if you think about it, uh, if, if we had sort of sat around and waited to decide that transistors were going to be the right technology before we built the rest of the stack, that probably wouldn't have been wise. So instead, what we did on the classical side was we, over time, developed a layering strategy that looks sort of like this middle um, view that we have. Um, we have the chance now to think about that for the quantum side. Um, and in particular, uh, some of the work that we have been doing over the past years, and that we'll zoom in on even more, is what should go into the middle between quantum algorithms and qubit implementations and how to structure it. Uh, so uh, Fred mentioned some of this, and I will drill in a little bit more, and then Ollie's going to give you kind of the, the current state of play uh, from IBM's perspective. Okay, so what do we actually need in terms of quantum computing tool flows? Well, one thing we need are quantum computing programming languages. Uh, some of them have been developed. Uh, probably we can re-examine them. I'll show you a few bits of syntax from ours, uh, and then I'll talk about uh, some of the things that we need to, to do going forward. Uh, we need to have support for compilation and mapping onto quantum computing hardware, which right now is sort of analogous to FPGA synthesis, uh, that is, you sort of know all your inputs and you map and optimize as best you can. Um, we also need the ability to do performance and resource estimation for machines that don't exist yet. Uh, over the past 10 years that I've worked on quantum, I often get asked, why would an architect work on quantum? Because it's so hard to build stuff, you, you, you have to simulate. Well, I'm sorry, but like, look at, look at ISCO. We simulate a lot. We're okay with simulating next generation hardware using this generation's, um, simulation technique. So we need to be able to look at where we can do maybe not aspects of simulating the answer to the problem, but aspects of resource estimation and performance simulation using the tools that we have. Um, right now in the NISQ era, we probably won't have the luxury of having error correction. We're going to have to compute using noisy qubits, and we won't have the ability to error correct those qubits because error correction is roughly a 10 to 50x overhead, and we don't have enough qubits to spare. But eventually, ECC management uh, is going to be one of the things that uh, we'll need to look at, and we also have done some of that work already, uh, sort of looking way ahead in, in futuristic qubit counts. And then as we mentioned, there's also an important role in having the classical control software that executes alongside the quantum um, to basically orchestrate the execution and to do the control sequencing. And uh, some of the folks in the back who did the, the morning tutorial have, have led the way in uh, sort of showing these microprogram sequencers for quantum computing uh, hardware. Uh, there's also things like debugging, and finally, just the layering choices. Uh, we have done some of the work along these lines. We won't have time to talk about it, uh, but there is an awful lot of existing related work that's out there attacking different aspects of these problems. One of the things I wanted to zoom in on is the quantum software stack. You can think about it something like this. This is uh, just this is not the the sort of system stack, but this is just sort of what are the types of software that one needs. Uh, you need to be able to express an algorithm in a high level way, so writing correct code and so forth. You need to be able to compile it. Uh, so basically select and decompose into gates, uh, get to something that looks like an assembly language code. Uh, if you have the luxury of error correction, then you can split the assembly language into sort of a logical level scheduling. 
um, followed by an error corrected sort of underlying layer. And then the physical layer where you do the actual control manipulations. Uh, sorry, the physical layer where you schedule onto actual qubits, and then some device control firmware, sorry, uh, at the very bottom that uh, is orchestrating how the actual machine is going to work. Think about that as microwave or, or laser pulses that are similar to the sort of voltage changes that we would use for control in a classical machine. So uh, when you read about um, quantum algorithms today, you'll hear a lot about circuit width and circuit depth. Uh, so this is a depiction of a, a quantum circuit, if you will. Those are That is time going from left to right, and those are different qubits up and down. And so one of the things that you'll hear about is people will talk about um, uh, circuit depth, and what they mean is essentially runtime. So that's uh, how wide is it from left to right? How, how, how many steps is it from left to right? Uh, and then circuit width, sorry, is... Uh, always top to bottom, uh, and that is the number of qubits. So what we're trying to do in these NISQ machines is manage circuit width because we only have, say, 10 to 100 qubits to play with. Uh, today, we're going to be running on an IBM machine that has 20 qubits available, for example. Uh, and then we have to manage uh, circuit depth or time cycles uh, because each uh, operation actually incurs some amount of error. And if we take too many steps, we'll actually not be able to get the right answer. We have to be able to finish before um, the state of those qubits decoheres. So typical questions for these resource-aware compilation or mapping steps are sort of how many resources do we need, either qubit or time? To what extent can they be optimized? And what are the, the best choices? And people have actually been doing this for quite some time, so for years now. Uh, the basic structure of a lot of these uh, is, again, from sort of high-level language to an intermediate format to optimizations and then down to real resource estimates. What I wanted to talk about in a little more detail is our programming language, not because it's the best, but because it's the one that we know. Um, and in particular, one of the sort of self-deprecating jokes that I like to make is, do you really want a programming language that was designed by a bunch of computer architects? Or do you want a programming language that was designed by programming languages researchers? So the difference between our past work and the work we're launching now is that we have managed to cajole some programming language resource researchers to play with us, and some of them are in the back room, uh, the back of the room. So next steps will be to come up with different languages that maybe don't look quite so much like C, uh, and that maybe have more formal principles to, to manage the execution. Uh, but basically, scaffold is a C-like language, uh, and our compiler that tool flow that we developed and that we will use some of today translates from that scaffold programming language to a general quantum assembly language. And we were able to build this whole compiler framework based off of LLVM, which is widely used across much of computer science for a range of other purposes. So we modified the Clang front end parser and then converted from SCAFCC to the LLVM intermediate representation. And then from there, we can do things like count up qubits. Uh, so the kinds of optimizations that, we'll, that we lean heavily on are things like loop unrolling and constant propagation. So uh, just as one example, uh, one of the sort of long time algorithms in the quantum computing world is, is Grover's search algorithm. Uh, I've depicted it in a circuit uh, diagram down at the bottom here. And then uh, the code here is essentially the scaffold expression of Grover's search algorithm. What you can see are a uh, set of iterations that correspond to this. Uh, and yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. You can't pin me down, though. Uh, <laughs> let me see if I can. And I wander. Uh, so a set of iterations here that correspond to, to this iterative process here. Uh, the diffusion step here is a module that you call as a, as a function module here. There are um, a lot of uh, aspects of this that look like C, so integers and so forth. But there are also aspects of this that are new types supported for the purpose of quantum computation, uh, in particular, say, qubits. Uh, so. Uh, we can do function calls. We have 
um, some gates that are intrinsic and some gates that we can define within the computation. From that high-level code, we can compile down to LLVM intermediate representation. Uh, that gives us the ability to do the kinds of aggressive optimizations that we want to essentially take something that looks like C and unroll it and basically map it onto an array of gates much like an FPGA. Uh, so we're going to take the uh, C from the previous page, or say here's the diffusion module, and get it into an LVM structure that looks like this. And then from there, we can uh, either, if we're doing resource estimation, we can count resources using this kind of a structure. We can ascertain that right there, we're going to need four qubits. And so if we're trying to figure out sort of total qubit requirements, we can track that as we go. And then after that, we start applying the optimization passes, including unrolling the loops so that, uh, so for example, um, instead of having a four iteration loop to go across the qubits, we can unroll that and apply it four times. We can also constant propagate as well. Um, for much of the work that we did in the past, we stopped around here and we were able to do assessments of for this error correction approach versus that error correction approach, how many qubits are needed, how many cycles are needed, and so forth. Uh, but over the past three years, it's been important to actually be able to target, and it's been possible to actually target real hardware. And so with that in mind, uh, different uh, groups are trying to go from this sort of chasm level or intermediate representation level down to real hardware. Uh, we have one path that Ollie's going to talk about next that gets us down to, to chasm. And I also wanted to note that, so for example, Fred mentioned the the um, paper that won the Micro 50 Best Paper Award, that expresses a set of microprogram steps that get you from, from their uh, chasm syntax down to the uh, microoperations, both the quantum microoperations and the classical control microoperations uh, that orchestrate computation on their presumed microarchitecture. So there's different uh, sort of back ends that one could envision, just as in sort of classical code, you have different front ends coming into an LLVM IR and then different back ends coming out of it. So uh, I wanted to talk at the, at the end a little bit about layering options. So I sort of showed this sea of sort of opportunities, things that we need to do. Uh, it would be extremely tempting to sort of put on our architecture hats and come up with a layered diagram that looks much like this, device independent, uh, device dependent, and so forth, um, and stick with it. That might eventually be where we end up, uh, but right now the challenge is that we're facing very tight resource constraints, and Fred gave some places where we need a lot of information flow up and down the stack uh, that make um, these sort of sharp abstractions maybe not ready for prime time yet. I'll give some examples of that if I have time. Uh, so there are other layering options that we could do. So for example, we could talk about sort of domain-specific paths that cut all the way down from high-level languages, uh, whether it's scaffold or whatever comes after scaffold, uh, down to particular implementations. That seems like uh, sort of heresy for a computer architect to stand up and say, except, come on, it's not that different from TensorFlow API and a TPU underneath there, right? So we're already doing this on the classical side because we're facing some of these same sorts of constraints on the classical side as well. So what I want to point out is that while we strive towards abstractions and so forth in the future, it may be actually a good long time before we go there. Uh, I'll take you through one quick example of the kinds of sort of full stack parallelism and hardware trade-offs that we've looked at in the past and why we think it's going to be a while before we can actually um, sort of sort of draw hard abstraction layers. Quickly, this uh, trade-off, this example pertains to quantum phase estimation, which is a fundamental subroutine in several quantum applications, including Shor's algorithm. 
Um, there have been different implementations proposed. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, you can sort of view them as a menu. So KHT uh, does many trials of an operation that requires only modest operator precision, but because it's doing those many trials in parallel, it tends to have a very high qubit requirement. Uh, approximate QFT does a single trial at higher precision, tends to have lower qubit requirements, but lower parallelism. And in addition, we proposed a medium sort of Goldilocks thing with modest parallelism, iterative invocations each with modest precision requirements, and so it's sort of the in-between approach. And what we did was we looked at these across different um, assumptions about qubit availability and different assumptions about the benchmarks that we were using. The, the top being a micro benchmark that is just uh, doing quantum phase estimation, and the bottom being that embedded into a Shor's algorithm. So the first thing you see is that these qubit counts are massive compared to what we actually have. This is sort of a futuristic study rather than a, a sort of in, a current hardware study. Um, the second thing you can see is that the application characteristics matter a lot. Uh, so this curve and that curve look quite different. And the third thing you can see is that hardware resource limits where we are left to right there is a, there is, I swear, an axis label down here that says qubit counts. Uh, you can't see it. Uh, so where we are left to right on this graph uh, affects which of these uh, approaches is going to be the best. Okay, so I don't expect that you understand quantum phase estimation at this particular moment, but what I hope you get out of this is that I've just shown you a case where, depending on the hardware resources, i.e. the number of qubits, and the application characteristics, i.e. which app algorithm I'm running, the right answer varied. And so what that says is that's sort of one example of where we need this full stack ability to push information up and down in order to, to come up with really good optimal techniques. And over a sort of recent research, we've, we've actually done several of other examples um, as well. Okay. So... Uh, I have given you like a very brief tour of one quantum programming language. I've given you a very brief tour of some issues and trade-offs in uh, sort of layering up and down the stack. Um, and hopefully I've made a case for the fact that actually, uh, adding to what Fred said, these tool flows are going to be really important as intermediaries between high-level algorithms and low-level hardware, especially when we're trying to cram as much as we can into, say, 100 qubits.